Hey guys, welcome back to Home Built, and in this episode, we are going to start cleaning up the engine bay of the Ferrari. All right, guys, those of you who were watching last week will have seen that I finished up the engine wiring loom on the Ferrari. Previously, I did the body wiring loom. So the wiring is all pretty much done on the car now. And uh, that mostly marks the end of all of the systems that I need to actually get to work on the car. It's actually uh, time to start tidying it up and getting it ready for paint. For those of you who missed it, I'll put a link up above so you can uh, catch up and uh, think about subscribing if you haven't. It does help us out, hit the bell uh, for notifications to let you know when something else has been posted up. A few questions that came, uh, arose, that kept coming up last week uh, that I thought I would address. There are lots of questions about the T-Map that I've got here. So um, there's some suggestions saying that can't I run it off of a vacuum line? I can't because this is a uh, inlet temp sensor and a map sensor. If it was just a map sensor, you can run a vacuum line and put it anywhere. But because it is an inlet temperature sensor as well, um, basically it will read the, the temperature of the air. It needs to be in the airflow, which this is. Uh, there were other comments saying that, uh, why don't I put it underneath, in, like underneath here? This these cross tubes do are only going to one cylinder each, so there's actually less um, less flow of the air from one of these, and also uh, it takes the air from these only at low revs, and then it opens up, and it doesn't. So, so putting them in the middle is not going to work. There is no crossover between the two. Um, no single crossover that goes between both sides, so that's not a uh, not a good place to mount it. That's why I mounted it where I did, and uh, yeah, I think it's the best place to put it. Uh, I'm not concerned about it being on one side and not the other. I'm comfortable enough with that running one sensor. The other thing that, that keeps coming up, the key people obviously missed the previous episode where I talked about the uh, oil filter where it is. It's not the best location, but uh, it's still serviceable where it is, even in the car, and uh, it's easy. there was no easy remote oil filter solution, and uh, I don't want an ugly remote oil filter sitting somewhere where you can see it. That's nice, hidden away, perfect spot for it. So uh, that brings me on to what I am going to be tackling today. So my plan for this episode is to actually start tidying things up and getting everything, as I said, ready for paint. And that includes the engine bay. So uh, now that I have fitted everything I need, I've got all these superfluous brackets and holes and things around the place that are not needed anymore and I don't obviously want to have all these ugly unused bits. I wanted a nice neat looking uh, engine bay. So uh, that's what I'm going to start tackling with today. It's time to strip out some of the bits that uh, I don't need in here for the time being and uh, start filling up some holes. All right, so you can see here, I've gone around and I have unpicked all of the excess little tabs all the way around the place. So there is uh, a nice, clean looking engine bay. Now I've got to go through and uh, in a few of these little spots, um, there's some dance and stuff that I don't like. And also even, I'm not gonna see if I can uh, get rid of these little pressed out spots. These big ones I'll leave. 
Um, I'm sort of happy enough to leave that in there for the time being. Um, we'll see how I feel about it later. But these ones here, I might be able to actually just get the dolly behind and the hammer and just uh, tap them out and uh, get that nice and flat. So uh, let's do some hammer and dolly work. So that worked quite well. Those parts are nice and flat now, and uh, all of the sort of extra dents and stuff around here that were a little bit rough have all been tidied up. So um, that is looking pretty good. Next thing I need to tackle is um, making a bit more clearance for the engine. So when the engine was in, I actually marked these sections out, and I need to cut a, uh, a wedge shape out of these rails here on either side and um, fill them in, because the engine just sits a bit wide there. It doesn't touch but it gets too close we want a bit more clearance so I'm just going to uh, clearance that out and that'll give the engine a bit more space in the engine bay Alright, so as you saw, I made a couple of uh, little templates. Basically, I just cut my little um, wing shapes almost out of these uh, both sides. And uh, and then I used some cardboard, just pressed it into the shape so it, uh, it left an impression, made it easy to cut out and make some templates. I then went and made a couple of nice thick, this is a 1.6 mil plate. Um, this stuff is not that thick, but uh, I thought it's better to do uh, thicker reinforcing in here anyways as part of the rails. So uh, I've made up these two pieces. I managed to uh, curve them on the vise. So I'm going to weld them in now, and uh, that should be one of the uh, little tasks ticked off the list. All right, and we have our sculpting in on both sides now. It's all filled in nicely, and uh, there's still a couple of holes I've got to fill in there, and there's a little pinhole over here. And so we're gonna get on with that, and we're also going to get down here, and I need to box in these two end plates. This is actually something I trimmed off to get the, uh, the exhaust headers in, so let's get on with that. Alright, so I've uh, capped these two sides off, I'm happy with that now, so it's time to start moving on to some of these holes around the place that I don't need anymore. So uh, obviously a lot of these things were here for the original Alpha setup, which I am obviously not running anymore. But to start with, what I, what I need to go back and do is make sure I finish off drilling all the holes that I need. And I actually started these two holes uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was doing the engine loom. This is where the engine loom has to pass through the bulkhead, but I couldn't do it while the engine's in. Now the engine's out, let's uh, finish doing that and uh, make some holes that can fit our bulkhead connectors. All right, so we are getting there on the engine bay. I've got rid of uh, all of the brackets and uh, drilled out my new holes and stuff like that. Now it's time to start going through and filling up some of these extra drill holes and stuff like that that are in the engine bay that I don't want to be left there. And um, things like this uh, hole here, a uh, really good thing that I, uh, I picked up to fill those things is um, this little guy here. This is a copper plate that will sit behind the hole 
and uh, it's got a magnet on the other end and an adjustable screw head. So basically, I would stick it behind the hole, in this case, like that, and I can sort of adjust how tight it sits onto the uh, onto the hole. And basically, the copper head, the weld doesn't stick to the copper, so I can stick it right behind. It gives a bit of a heat sink so that the the uh, the metal won't just blast away. And uh, I can weld up to it, and it'll sort of uh, and it'll give a nice flat surface on the back of the weld instead of the weld just sort of pouring through. So uh, I'm going to put this in behind and go through and fill in a few of these little holes. So you can see there, um, I haven't grounded or anything yet. That's just uh, welded up the hole, that's filled it up. I did a couple more over here. You can see just uh, nice little plug welds to uh, fill up. That was quite a large hole that I still managed to fill up. So uh, that hole would have been about, probably about eight mil round. Just filling away slowly. So uh, the next thing I think I'm gonna do is I'm going to attempt to hammer and dolly these out flat. They may not work. If not, my alternative is to cut out this panel and to replace it to flatten it out. So it is a bit flatter, similar to what I did on this other side here when I did the, uh, the steering conversion. So uh, let's see if the hammer and dolly can get rid of these indentations. Yeah, like I thought, it's not going to uh, hammer out easily. It's gonna stretch the metal too much and not be that nice. So I'm just gonna cut out a panel and uh, weld in a new piece. All right, that, is, that came out really good. This is a really nice flat finish. Um, taking my time and uh, TIG welding it all and just making sure the levels are absolutely perfect every time you sort of tack, get it perfectly level, tack, level, tack, level. And then once I had sort of, you know, one inch gaps, I could fill it in as long as they were perfectly level as well. Fill it in, hammer it out. And uh, yeah, that I am very happy with. So uh, that bit's done. Now we have to move around and we've got some of these uh, holes, that one I've got to keep, but there's a couple on the other side over here that I need to block up. So uh, that's the next thing is to make some patches to block these holes. And this one I might even cut out whatever this thing is. So uh, let's get into that. All right, so those three holes all went really smoothly. So uh, it was pretty simple. I just got uh, my piece of sheet, held it over the hole, drew a circle from the inside, uh, just because it was easier to reach, you can do it either side. Cut them out with a set of tin snips, um, held them on with a magnet and, drew, and uh, welded them in. Uh, I did use the, uh, this clamp again behind some of these bits, particularly where I had a bit more of a gap. Um, and it just makes life so much easier. Now I've got to tackle this one up in the top corner here and uh, that's going to be marginally more, uh, more troublesome but really not that bad.
All right, and that is looking a whole lot better now. There are no holes that shouldn't be there. Uh, a nice, smooth, clean engine bay. That is going to make the Ferrari engine sitting in the middle just pop nicely. Okay, so I've mocked my cover up and it's looking nice. Now I need to transfer it over onto some aluminium and uh, see how it will go going back in. All right, that looks much nicer than it did before. It's just a nice, neat cover. Covers over the top of the radiator and uh, and just tidies up the front end of this car. Uh, you can't get that overflow off without taking the panel off, but the panel's only held on by two screws. So it's not a big deal. Uh, you can get the, uh, the regular radiator cap off anyway, so you don't really need to get to that because that's the highest point. Uh, I am very happy with that. That is the entire engine bay looking good. All right, so the engine bay is really looking good now. Um, it was one of these things that I just had to tackle. Now the engine's out, I've gone through and just finished off a lot of these little bits and pieces in here now. And uh, that is a huge step forward, but it's taken me all the time I have this week. So that means it's time for fun facts with Mrs. Jeff. Hey guys, 1962 was a tumultuous year for Ferrari, but it was building what is arguably its most iconic car at the same time. Ferrari's chief engineer Giotto Bizzarini began work on a new car to compete in the 1962 Group 3 category based on the existing 250 GT short wheel base platform. This car was of course the 250 GTO or Gran Turismo Homologato or homologation and it was powered by the well proven 3 litre Colombo V12 making 300 horsepower. Halfway through the car's development, Bizzarini and most of the other engineers were fired at Ferrari as we discussed last week by Enzo Ferrari himself. So the car was actually completed by Moro, Vagheri and Scaglietti. The 250 GT made its racing debut at the 1962 12 Hours of Sebring, driven by the current F1 champion Phil Hill, who was annoyed to be driving a GT car. But in the end, he actually surprised himself as he became second overall behind a full race 250 Testarossa. The 250 GTs went on to win Ferrari the GT manufacturer's titles in 1962, 63 and 64. Three 330 GTO specials were made using the 250 GTO body and chassis, but with a bigger four litre engine. Okay, including these, a total of 39 GTOs were made and they stand as the most expensive car in the world with the latest one selling in 2018 for 70 million US dollars. <laughs> All right, well, um, again, it Probably doesn't feel like I got much done, but uh, that was a lot of work getting in and uh, I'm very happy with how the engine bay is looking now. It's looking much more complete and uh, and just neater. So when the car, when the engine is finally in it, when the uh, whole thing is together, it's going to be just uh, the, the nice Ferrari engine sitting in the middle of a nice clean engine bay. That's what I wanted to look of and that's what I think I'm going to get. So smoother. He said he's done lots of smoothing smooth, this week. Smoothing. Smoothing. Yeah. Aww. <laughs> Please like funny. and subscribe if you haven't. You want to follow Jeff a day, no, not a day earlier. See the videos a day earlier with our ads, Patreon. Yes. And um, yeah, we're having a pretty cold, drizzly, almost yeah, summer like over here in Australia. Two or three days from summer and it's 
cold and pretty miserable. Yeah, but when we say cold, it's like 10 degrees. It's not like minus 20. Yeah. It's 10 degrees. It's still cold, like, considering it's three days from summer. So, anyway. It's funny. All right, guys, we'll see you next time. Bye, guys. Omelagation. Omelagato. Omelagato or omelagation. GTO. Shush. My process. The 250 GTO made its... The 250 GT has been on to win the... Moro Fugari and Scaglietti. Can we just say by two new people? No, Scaglietti is not new. Two new people, but two new Italian named people. No. <laughs> <laughs> They're very old Italian named people. <laughs> <laughs> They're a bit old at the time. They're young men, probably, or middle aged men. Yeah. Like us, that prime. <laughs> <laughs>